Well met everyone, I am Rich the Lich, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how function informs design. And through those two things, function and design, you can start getting a little bit better in your world building efforts. Let's take a look. I'm not going to say that this video that's coming up, which is a behind the scenes in the making of Two Towers, the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Peter Jackson, of course. So we're talking, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was. It was a long time ago. But this was uh, one of the big jumping off points where I just became so enamored and fascinated with watching everything that went behind the scenes in making something, especially, of course, in the worlds of fantasy and science science fiction. So I remember when Phantom Menace came out, I did everything I could to obtain and acquire every DVD, every special edition, every behind the scenes edition that showed how Darth Maul's lightsaber was made and why did they use the makeup they used, so on and so forth. I believe Lord of the Rings did it best, even to this day, where you have all of the options of media and Blu-ray and just the ability to expand and put so much material on one piece of media 15 20 years ago when this box set so real quick on screen here's what it looks like i have three of these it is a special extended edition so pretty big it's got the movie and it's the extended edition that i don't think was shown in theaters but there's like five dvds in here or cds so that's almost an obsolete thing in and of itself right everything is digital and streaming and whatnot but I put these in every once in a while and they are a wealth of information. It is gold for me. Not only does it inspire, but it just reminds me with some bullet points that I want to check through when I'm creating something that makes it feel living, breathing, real, and compelling. And that's what Peter Jackson did with Weta Workshop over in New Zealand and so on. So when we watch this video, I'm just going to sit back. I'll watch it with you. Let's get through it and then I'll talk about it very quickly. These creatures have no life beyond battle and destroying the enemy. So therefore, their whole costume and their armor, it's all forward-facing, aggressive. The concept is that they're thick, heavy, and brutal. They carry a chain mail. Their backs are not armored at all because the idea is that they'd never run from battle. I found them to be very frightening when they, when they were eventually done because Although we'd been pointing the design process along that road to actually see it all come together, I thought, my God, you know, what have we done? This is like Frankenstein. The helmets hide any hint of humanity that they may have because they turn them basically into faceless fighting machines. In order to make them all look not quite the same, it was also important that there be specializations within that army. Now the four cores of the Irakai are demonstrated by the helmets laid out in front of me. This is the Berserker helmet. It actually has a captain's crest on it. But the idea behind the Berserker helmets is that they, they shave their hair completely bald. And they fill the helmet up with red human blood. And in doing so, when they put the helmet on, it creates this mantle around their neck and drives them into this bloodlust that makes them more crazed as they go into battle. This is the swordsman's helmet with the head-butting spikes used to drive into the eyes of the opposition. This is the pikesman's helmet. The eye slit forces the pikesman only to look up so that they are forced to use their pikes as they try and hook the enemy off the wall at Helm's Deep. And this is the sapper's helmet. Saruman has managed to design gunpowder, and these characters have these huge shields that cover the back of their necks so that as they dig under Helm's Deep to pack in the gunpowder to try and blow away the wall, any falling rocks will be shed off their backs as they endeavour to plant this deadly brew. Brilliant stuff, right? So here's the idea behind it. You notice there that 
first off, one of their big considerations is they're filming it. So it has to be something that looks good on screen, right? It has to be something that resonates with the audience and draws in their attention and just quite simply looks cool. But they didn't want that samey feel as John Howe said. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to create sort of different divisions. And as I kind of ramble through this and just sort of illustrate to you how this is a very good way to think through design when you're world building. Take the Urukai that they created here for Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings and Two Towers and just apply the Urukai and what they did with them here and in, in that video you just saw and apply that to your orcs in your world. Apply them, apply that to your dragons, apply it to your elves. You can replace the word Urukai with any living breathing thing, right? And notice that, yes, they wanted to create four different divisions, but the way they did that is they created four different helmet types because that's what you're going to see on screen, of course, right? The other thing, too, is it gets that actor in that sort of role, the stuntman or whoever it was that was playing within those Urukai suits. The moment you put that helmet on and they give you a little bit of that backstory, as Richard Taylor just did, yeah, whether it was food coloring or, you know, grape juice or whatever, but the moment that Zerker guy puts that helmet on and he's explained, you know, the story of that this Urukai, should he be a real living, breathing thing long time ago, he would have had it filled with blood and it gives him this bloodlust. But that makes the actor kind of portray that role a little better, right? It gets him in character, so to speak. And the beauty in that, the way that they sort of address that, where what is the function of these Urukai? You know, and especially when you break it down from a race, a group of orcs, so to speak, that are essentially nothing but just war machines of destruction. It can be very easy to make them almost narrow-minded, you know, or, or one track, right? Think of the barbarian with the great axe. That's all he does. They could have easily just said, well, we're just going to costume up the Urukai anyway, because all they do is they just run in and they kill. They don't do anything else. But by giving them those four divisions, and then they sort of talked through what would they do, and those helmets inform that. You have that kind of helmet that looks like it's more of a bowl. It can contain liquid, and that's where they put the blood on their head. And that function of it is intended to function as something that draws and, and creates this bloodlust effect on this Urukai. That's why the helmet looked the way it looked. And then you have the the general, you know, the general war force where they had the headbutt spikes. Whereas they close in and they get up over the wall and they're in melee combat with their weapons and whatnot, they have these spikes on their helmet so they can headbutt. So they're now more efficient in melee, right? Because that is how they would function as a attacking Urukai. But the helmet and the design of what they created visually, aesthetically, informs that and it just highlights that even more and then you have the pikemen where you know when you have that slit and you're having to look up because they're poking at the tops of the walls and then you have that large like he said that large kind of uh you know steel plate in the back so that when they're rum you know crumbling down rock and stone the rocks will fall and it's not going to hit and harm them on the back and I don't know if it was on this video but just prior to that a few minutes prior they were talking about how all of the Urukai armor I think a big part of it was for filming because they talked about how the actors had to be out there in real time, you know, filming Helm's Deep and it was raining and, you know, they're out there for many hours filming that Battle of Helm's Deep scene and, you know, they're wearing 40, 50 pounds of prosthetics and armor and whatnot. So to allow it be a little more wieldy and allow the actors to move efficiently and get into this stuntman martial artsy melee combat they minimize the weight of the armor by not putting any armor on their backs but it the design of that was based on the function and the function that they had talked about was the urukai never run so they don't need armor on their backs they're never going to turn their backs to you and the point that i'm kind of getting with all of this you know it was possibly most beautifully done when we talk D and fantasy I think everyone, to a certain extent, yeah, you have Beowulf and things like this, essentially goes back to Tolkien as sort of, you know, the father for a lot of these things and where so much of this stuff comes from. I mean, there's a reason why there's elves and dwarves and orcs and things like that all over the place. 
just the same as with Peter Jackson's movies. The way, and you know, when I watch these behind the scenes movies, it constantly keeps reminding me, especially when it's been four or five years that I put those DVDs in and I watch them now, it keeps reminding me that the best stuff I've read in any campaign settings and world building books and in creature design or Volo's guide where it extrapolates a little more on the goblins or hobgoblins versus just a little stat block. And it gives you a reason why they exist the way they exist. So much of this stuff has already been done to the highest level of excellence by Peter Jackson in his Lord of the Rings movies and obviously therefore Tolkien in Middle Earth and the Lord of the Rings trilogy and, and The Hobbit as well. And I think when you keep thinking through that process that way, you I always talk about you always kind of are able to have one thing inform another and sort of step you through that process, right? And by thinking about okay, I want to design a place, a city. I want to design a suit of armor. Think of what the function is, and that's going to start to help you work through how you want to design that thing, just as they did with those four helmets. You know, the four helmets, when you look at them and you're staring at them at a table, might be, oh, I like that helmet, I like that helmet, I like that one, I like that one. But why are they different? But you could tell they had a story as to which sort of regiment or, you know, little pocket group of Urukai would wear each of those individual helmets. And then the other thing it does is it starts to give you more information as to why certain blacksmiths are needed in this area and why the dwarves are coveted and almost protected as like a treasured group of people because they're the only ones that can make this type of armor. But when your players ask or they see, why do I even need that type of armor? Why is that armor three times the cost of regular full plate in the player's handbook? you can start explaining that it functions in this way. And that is why those soldiers are known as such and such. So you can see how function always informs your design. When you create a monster, when you create anything, a, a, a structure, a, a location, a city, what is the intention of that place, of that living thing? And then from there, you can start designing on top of that. And I believe that is how you should go about your world building efforts. That's all I have for you folks today. Thanks everyone for watching and take care.